In this video, I am going to be going over how to write the first portion of your midterm. It's called the hook. That's sort of what I call it. It's where you're trying to really grab the attention of your patron, your reader, and be really persuasive in convincing them that this is a problem that needs to be addressed with immediacy and really just engaging them and helping them want to read further. So like I said, none of this is published yet, but it will be by the time this is posted. Just click midterm exemplar with annotations if you'd like to follow along or examine it after this video. So this is a student of mine from the past. His paper is definitely scientific in nature, but I do want you to know the only thing that's different is that his is utilizing MLA formatting and not APA. So please just make sure that you are taking note of that. Um, you are using APA formatting. So just to go over how this should be structured, this is the top of the sheet. You have one inch margins. Everything is in 12 point Times New Roman font. So that should be the first thing that you are doing. Um, if you scroll down and look, the heading should be structured exactly as this is. This would be your address. And then you would have a line break, a space, then you would have the due date, then you would have another space, then you would put to whom the letter is being addressed. This is your patron. I've talked about this a lot in prior videos, but you want to make sure that you are writing to an individual person. Um, so you'll see that Alex has chosen to written to Kenneth Fraser. Um, and he is from the Merck Company Foundation. So you'll see we have his name, where he's from, and the address of that patron um, and where that foundation is located. Then we have another space. So you can see that just this structure is very similar to how you structured your cover letter. Um, and then you always want to use dear and then you address your patron and you always have to use a comma. So this should be the very first thing you're setting up. Make sure that it looks like this. Everything is single spaced. You can see that just by looking at this paragraph. So let's just take a look at Alex's hook. Um, so his hook stops right before we get to that first title, Digging Deeper into Trenton. I told you in the directions that generally speaking, a hook is one to three paragraphs in length. It's a little less than a page. Um, so just be mindful of that. Normally, I would say it's about a half a page of typed text. So you'll see Alex's is about a half a page. So I'm just going to go through this with you. And I've taken a lot of notes just so you can sort of look through. In a nation as affluent and resourceful as the United States, one may be confident enough to believe that food insecurity is not urgent an issue as it once was in the past. However, this is simply not the case. So just looking at those first two lines, we have a longer, more complex sentence, and that's followed up by a shorter, simpler sentence. And he's sort of saying, here are our expectations, and here's why our expectations or assumptions are often wrong. So it's definitely very well written. Um, it plays off of what America is known for regarding its reputation. And he's basically going to break down that reputation and prove to us that people are still hungry, even though we're considered one of the most affluent nations in the world. It's engaging, it grabs our intention, um, and it's well written. So it's definitely a strong opening. Let's keep going. Given the U.S.'s flourishing food production system, efficient distribution channels, and food engineering breakthroughs, it can still be difficult to comprehend that 42 million people, or 13% of the population of the U.S., experience some form of food insecurity. So like I said before, um, anything that's highlighted in orange is a statistic that he's pulling from a source, and here he gives us a really offensive and troubling statistic to think about, that that 42 million people are hungry. They are struggling and they are suffering from food insecurity. And he shows that in two different ways. I really liked that. He says 13% of the population or 42 million people. And that's not a small number. It makes us feel uneasy reading it and it makes us feel definitely um, sad and not great. Um, it's devastating. And then you can see that there is that parenthetical citation. So we know where that's coming from, even though nothing's in quotes and he's just paraphrasing. So that's important. By simple definition, food insecurity is access by all people at all times to enough food for an active, healthy life. Um, and I think it's important that he includes the definition of food insecurity because it helps direct the purpose of his paper. 
Um, you never want to offer a definition if it's too simplistic or elementary, but here it's really just directing the main focus of his paper so it works well. Once again, this is cited, and because it's a direct quote, it's in quotations. This problem is seen in the thousands of areas across the country, but a reasonable place to begin restoration would be the neighborhood of East Trenton in the city capital of New Jersey. This focus area, which harbors an estimated 3,600 residents, is experiencing a great deal of distress in regard to hunger, and I believe its relative proximity to Rutgers University makes it an ideal candidate to rehabilitate. Um, so he then tells us, here's the population I'm working with. He's obviously citing the statistic from Meal Gap, um, and he offers some evidence as to why he wants to work there. So we'll get a little bit more into that as we go on. But paragraph one is very explanatory. It's focused and we understand the purpose. All right, going on to paragraph two. Besides the evident bodily disorders associated with food insecurity, increased risk of hospitalization, poor health, iron deficiency, malnutrition, there are many other underlying complications beyond the physical that are often overlooked. Studies have shown that having insufficient access to food can lead to developmental risk and behavior problems such as aggression, anxiety, depression, and ADD. Furthermore, evidence of poor school readiness, inferior school performance, and incomplete psychological growth has been found in children. It is because of limited resources that families in Trenton have resorted to low-cost or low-nutrition-dense food for the purpose of ensuring enough food is bought and eaten to avoid starvation. In essence, families consume fewer calories, carbohydrates, fruits, vegetables, grains, nuts, and other essential macro and micronutrients commonly found in quality diets. So here there's a lot going on. Um, he goes over disorders that are associated with food insecurity and they are severe and they make us think oh gosh this is definitely a problem and this needs to be addressed um, he also talks about the psychological risks and he brings it down to how it's really impacting children and their ability to learn and function in society um, and also in an educational sense this is fueling the problem in trenton right this low cost low nutrient dense food so if people are going to bodegas on the corner and buying food that's not super nutritious or they're going to fast food restaurants this is contributing to all of these issues that he discusses above um, regardless of this he offers enough data and evidence in these first two paragraphs for the patron to be one engaged two hooked like we are engaged and and persuaded that this is an issue three we start to really care about the population um, and four it's extremely well written uh, just to go back to aristotle's rhetorical triangle he really encapsulates all three pieces of it, right? So logos would be that logical argument. There are a ton of statistics that are speaking to logic. Yes, this is a problem. Here's how I define it. Uh, going to ethos, the credibility, he is using a lot of different credible sources. So you can see that he is citing and he is talking about like psychological risks. This makes us think it's not just a problem he's thinking of, like there is proof that there's a connection to this population. Um, and lastly, pathos, right? So He's basically using pathos in a bunch of different ways. That's that emotional connection. Um, he talks about how many people in the US are affected. That immediately makes us feel sad or worried. Um, going down, he also talks about how this really negatively impacts children. And that's something that makes us worried as well. Um, so this is all you're doing for that first portion. I just want you guys to get started. Um, so like I said, most people have one to three paragraphs here, but it's just a very quick overview before you go more in depth into your problem. So if we just look further with Alex's paper, and you're not doing this for the first peer review, you'll see that his next um, T title, sorry, is digging deeper into Trenton. And here's where he offers a lot more specific information. It's detailed. Um, and that is about the city of Trenton, um, specifically the area of East Trenton that he's focusing on and why they're suffering from food insecurity. So you can see that this is like the quick overview with some stats. And then he just dives in deeper and narrows regarding his scope. Um, the last thing I just want to tell you, Please make sure that you're not indenting paragraphs. You can see that his are all just aligned without indentations. There's just a space between each paragraph. You should follow that structure. And lastly, please just make sure you're utilizing block formatting or justifying your formatting. Um, if you highlight your text, um, 
there's the align left option, the align center option, and the align right option. It's the last option where all of those lines look equal. That's justifying your format, and that will give you that nice, neat line here. All right, if you have any questions about the hook, please let me know and shoot me an email.